Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of BHBA Family Law Presents Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. Along with Lauren Youngman from Youngman Reichstein, I'm Dan Bemmel, financial advisor and certified divorce financial analyst. During each episode of our show, we explore our guests' personal and professional history and dig into a meaningful legal topic. Lauren is out today, so we're joined by a very special guest host, former guest and overall friend of the program, Samantha Klein. Sam is the head of the California Family Law Practice at Withers, and she had so much fun here as a guest, she just had to come back. Please continue to join us for our upcoming episodes, always at 12.30 p.m. live on Zoom. Stacy Phillips on May 3rd, Grace Jamra and Michael Hanasab on June 7th, Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens on July 5th, Judge Harvey A. Silberman on August 2nd, and more to come later in the year. Sam. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. I'd like to welcome Judge Gordon today. Before we begin, a couple of housekeeping announcements. First, you will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program, so please take a moment to complete the survey, which is included with your certificate. The program will be available in a couple of days on the Beverly Hills Bar Association On Demand program. One of our newest benefits presented by Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. Our sponsor today and for the family law section is White Zuckerman, Warskowski, Luna, and Hunt. White Zuckerman, Warskowski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Sam. Today, as Sam said, we welcome Judge Scott Gordon to direct examination. A man who truly needs no introduction. Uh, I'll give him a little one anyway. During a 17-year tenure on the bench, including nine years in leadership, he handled thousands of cases, many of which were complex, high-profile business, sports, entertainment cases. Uh, long career before that that we're going to get into Judge Gordon is now an in-demand neutral at Signature Resolution. So our intention today is to learn as much as we can. But first, Your Honor, thank you so much for being here with us. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm honored to be here, especially with such distinguished uh, hosts. I'm, um, I'm thrilled to be here, and thank you. All right. Well, today we put a frame around our conversation. We're going to talk about the evolution of perspective, specifically your perspective, and how your world your view of the world has changed over time. Let's not bury the lead. Let's get right into it. How has your approach to settling a case changed as a mediator? You know, I think that it, what happens, at least has happened for me in settlement compared to trial is, and you and I had a chance to talk about some of this, you start drawing on a lot of your previous experience um, because it is a different skill set, you know, in um, in mediation, one of the things I appreciate about it is you can be much more creative. You can come up with solutions that fit this particular family uh, and are unique that we couldn't necessarily get to in court. You know, in court, we're much more siloed. You pick solution A or solution B. Um, I, I find that challenging. I think it's a challenge to us as mediators. I guess it's a challenge to lawyers. Um, I think it is a great benefit to litigants. The other thing about mediation is as much as trials, especially with wonderful lawyers in front of you are from a, a, an academic and practice perspective, great to do, you see the, the cost on litigants to go through them, both the monetary cost, the emotional cost, and people, their expectations are never met 100%. Um, and I think that in settlement, people are part of their solution and live with it much more. So all of that together means your approach as a mediator needs to be different than you are as a trial judge. So what do you try to communicate to the parties in this setting versus what you would communicate from the bench or during your current work as a private judge? I'll tell you, the biggest thing is you get to hear from the litigants. You know, the reality of trial is I really don't hear them. I I. I read the briefs written by wonderful lawyers like Samantha that say my client will testify as follows. They get up and argue brilliantly, but the client is sitting there. And when I do hear from them, it's the question and answer. In mediation, they get to tell me their story. And I think that is a very it's important for me to hear it. 
you gain a lot, but I think it's a very important exercise uh, for litigants to have someone, especially that comes from a judicial background, hear them. Um, I think that you have to have the ability and do it uh, in as diplomatic a way to give honest and candid feedback, because sometimes those expectations are dead on, sometimes they're they're not. But I think actually interacting with the litigants is, is a very different thing, and I really enjoy it. Do you think that the interaction you now have with the litigants, which was so much greater than it was when you were on the bench down at Stanley Mosque, do you think that that is helpful to you now that you do private judging, not just as a mediator, but as a pro tem, but with private parties? 100%. I, I, I actually firm, firmly believe that everything we do in life adds to that box of experience we have. And I think if you draw on it, uh, you get better in what you do. And yes, I think it does change your perspective. Um, I also think that, you know, it's a different relationship with lawyers and lawyers. Um, you're talking to them in mediation and hearing what they've gone through to get the case to that place. So absolutely. But when you're in the JPT role, in the judge pro tem, you're in the judge pro tem role, and it's back to you know, that very traditional, you know, balls and strikes and, and um, uh, objections. And, and, it, and it's nice to have the mix because both are, they're very different roles, but they're both kind of exciting. But absolutely, it's changed it. So now what would, having been in both worlds now for, for quite a while and talking about the differences, what should attorneys be doing to really move the ball forward on a case in either setting? Well, I, I, first of all, I'm going to use the, the, the phrase, I'm just going to get out of the way because we always say it and everything, and I'm just going to say it and then we'll say it again is meet and confer. So we'll just say that and go away. I, I do think the more prep there is, the better. Um, you know, uh, you're, the other thing is I am always flattered by the lawyer's assessment of my reading ability because you get the, the night before the mediation, your, your email chimes and you open it up and there's 375 pages so it's which i'm flattered by that but the more time you give me to i read everything i read everything the more time you give me to absorb it the better i think that uh lawyers both in trial in court in mediation in private trial knowing what they're asking for you know, get you know in a mediation getting i want spousal support i want the property oh. Okay, thanks, but let me know what your expectation is. I also think that, you know, the, and I, and I started mediation with this, I think that all mediations start the same way and, and I, I will figure out how to get over this, but you know, the first ask is always, I want everything plus a hundred dollars and a unicorn that, that sprays glitter. And the first response is you get nothing minus a hundred dollars and all the unicorns are dead. And we have to, we just, we have to get through that and it gets everybody all ramped up. You know, someday I will find a way to jump into the working offers, but there's always that initial, you know, uh, I want everything. But I, th I think managing expectations is a tremendous thing because if if litigants come in um, with unrealistic expectations, we can certainly get around them, but it's harder. I also think remembering that the you know sometimes you're doing two uh, two mediations. One is between spouses, the other is between lawyer one and lawyer two. And the more that we can reduce it to between spouses, the better. So when you're helping with media, whether you're doing a mediator, you're the judge pro tem, how important is it that we are presenting the case to you as opposed to each other? Because I've been in, I've had that experience both at Stanley Mosque or in private practice as well. It's a really good question and a really good point. It is amazing how often you're both in, in the court system, in private, where the lawyers are, are trying the case to each other instead of to you. You'll come out and say, look, I've read everything. What's really important to me is evidence about the red car. And they'll start going, well, no, I think it's a blue car. I think it's a green car. And you say, look, what's really important to me is the red car. And they go back and forth. And then you give the ruling and say, well, denied lack of evidence on the red car. And they say, why are you mad at me? I think listening to where where are the trier of fact, you know, I, I was a DA, I was a jury, you know, I do was a jury trial, the jury trials, and you learn in that environment to really be attuned to the jury, be attuned to us, you know, read us, and 
if you're doing well, know when to back it off. If you're, you know, I, I've had people go too far and literally snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, I think it's a really good point. And I think it can be hard for lawyers because like many times the litigants have an expert. I, I want you to be angry. I want you to convince. And I think, you know, think of it if you're the judge and one side stands up and says, we want everything. The other side's horrible and blah, 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 blah. And the other side stands up and says, you know what? I've looked at their 10 points and they're pretty reasonable on one through three. But on four through 10, here's where we are. If you're hearing that, which one are you going to move toward? Just as a human being. And I, I think that's, it's a really good question. Are there things you miss about being on the bench? Um, you know, this is, a, I've been really lucky as I've gone through different evolutions that I've left loving what I was doing and really have embraced the, uh, the, um, the new um, evolution. You know, Norman Lear said the two the keys to success are two words, done and next. I mean, you can get with done, what done with one phase of your life, be done with it and move to the next with enthusiasm. And I thought that was brilliant. Yes, I, you know, I, the, the bench is a, a really collegial place. I certainly maintain relationships, but having those relationships is um, really uh, wonderful. Um, I think that you see a we see a wonderful section of people in this environment, but in the court, you're seeing kind of everyone from Los Angeles, so it's a much more diverse population, which is interesting. The other thing is, I was very lucky to be able to do a lot of statewide. Uh, things I was on the Judicial Council, which was a, a tremendously wonderful experience and kind of missed that. But it's been a really nice evolution. This is a first time in 40 years, not in a county building. So that's that's certainly a change. So let's go back to the beginning uh, and learn a little bit more about how this perspective is, has developed. And I think you'll, I know you're going to add even more practice pointers and tips along sure. the way, things you've learned about presenting a case. But let's go all the way back. What was it like growing up in Los Angeles uh, when you did 50s and 60s? Uh, well, not that much in the 50s, but a little bit, yeah. A little bit, a little bit. You know, it was great. I, I grew up in the South Bay, which was a great place down Torrance, but kind of the South Bay. So it was kind of its own bubble uh, down there. But it was a, a great place, great schools. Um you know, certainly it was a very suburban area compared to when coming into Los Angeles itself. I've been in Los Angeles my whole life and I love L.A., love everything about L.A., um, but it was a great place to, to be raised, I had great school, so, I, you know, very lucky. So at what point in your youth did you decide, hey, I want to be a lawyer? I mean, did that come to you young? Did you have lawyers in your family? Like, where, how did you get there? No lawyers in my family. In fact, I think I was the first uh, person to go through college. My mom was a nurse. My dad was a World War II vet. Um, uh, pr but pretty early, I, you know, when in high school, I did all that debate and did the sports stuff, did all, did all the kind of that debate stuff and everything and loved it. So pretty early, it was, you know, the challenge for me was how do I get there and how do I pay for it? How do I get, you know, how do I pay for college? How do I pay for law school? That, that was kind of the challenge as it is for so many so many worse for young people today compared to the amounts we pay. Um, and I was lucky, got into law schools. I got into the Air Force Academy, went to the Air Force Academy with the notion of being able to go to grad school and, and law school. Um, it was a wonderful experience. It was uh, right when Vietnam was de-escalating was when I went there. So um, when it de-escalated, the military was awash in young officers. So our career patterns were, um, much more limited. So I decided that and the fact it was a pure math and engineering school, which those of us who are in the law always say we were told there would be no math, um, uh, came out to finish civilian and um, finished. And then I went on to became a cop and uh, for two reasons. One, I thought it'd be great experience for getting ready for law school. And two, it was a way to pay for law school. And I went to night school as a, as a police officer. So just to make it clear for people who don't know this about you, you were working at the police department during the day and you were going to law school at night. Actually a little different. I worked graveyard patrol. I, I, I was kind of vampire. I worked, I went to law school at night and then went into work at 10. Um, so yes, 
And then uh, the last year it was the last year and a half was a detective, but first first two and a half years I was uh, graveyard patrol. So um, when you went in that whole time period between going into the Air Force and then leaving and joining the police department, did you ever first did you ever think about staying in the military and making a yeah, career out of it? Absolutely, but again, it was very. I mean, think of it. You guys don't remember it because you're youngsters, but it was very tumultuous time then and the military was not exactly the place to be right and um yeah and, and then, you know it goes to some but tremendous honor of the military but um i want to go to law and you know and, and i i will tell you uh, being in the police department really was a wonderful experience that one you learn those skills of report writing and and seeing scenes and you know as lawyers we even in family law, we, we talk about events and we're reconstructing events. When you're a police officer, especially a detective, you're out at the scene. And that's a perspective which is very different. You know, when you're interviewing witnesses live at the time of trauma, it's very different. The other thing it gave me is, as a, yeah, I was 21, very young, you have to learn to be able to speak to all different kinds of people. You have to learn to build rapport. And I will tell you, those skills assist me now, and I, I've kept them. The other thing that was a wonderful experience about it, and I was surprised by this, and it still sticks with me, I was around lawyers and judges all the time, especially when I was a detective, because you're in testifying and filing cases. They were unbelievably supportive. They would, you know, I had one judge, and every time I testified at a prelim, he would keep me over and quiz me on torts and contracts. Um, but the public defenders, the DAs, they were just, you're seeing the people you want to be, and they're so supportive. It was, so as hard as it was going to high school, being in that environment was just tremendously helpful. So you had a bunch of cheerleaders on your side. A bunch of cheerleaders. Which is probably made you feel great at, at the time, but also how did that shape your career moving forward? One, when you left the police department, ultimately, and then as your career trajectory, trajectory continued? I, I, th I think it shaped a couple of ways. One, I think that, you know, something Daniel and I talked about the other day, in today's world, I may not have left the department because I think now at, there's so many officers that get graduate education law school and the departments put them in, use that. Um, it wasn't that time then. It was, you know, a lot of guys that were Vietnam vets, not a lot of us that had college educations. And it was kind of, if you're going to, some kind of grad school you're going to go so um i wanted to be a da uh and i was lucky enough uh, when i first graduated from law school the da had had a hiring freeze for a couple of years i went to a civil uh, insurance defense firm for about a year which was great experience to learn the civil stuff and then the da opened up and i went in and it was a, 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 a tremendous job and i got to do some really really great things as a da um, so as a, I want to spend a little more time uh, with Officer Gordon first. Okay. What type of cases did you work on uh, the most? What What was the actual work that you were doing in the department? Well, for patrol, you're in patrol. I was a, uh, I was in patrol the majority of the time. I was a field training officer for a couple of years, so I actually trained new officers coming in, which was a a really interesting experience. It's you know not only is it teaching, but it's evaluating and kind of on the job teaching, which was really, really interesting. And then I went into detective bureau. When I was a detective, I did uh, uh, vehicular homicides. So I actually became an accident investigation expert. So I had a guy out there with the skids, the measurement, went back to Chicago to the accident investigation school, uh, did auto theft, um, hit and run all kinds of vehicle crimes, which was really interesting stuff. What did you learn, especially on patrol, about the community, how people at the time interacted with the criminal justice system. What was your perspective on the the that relationship while you were while you were a police officer? A couple of things. One, I think the first thing you learn is that nothing's black and white. That there's always gray. There's always different different sides, different perspectives, no matter what it is. Uh, two, you, you you do see the the cruelty of people, and you see people that suffer tremendous trauma, and you feel for them. I do think at the time, you know, the way we were were it was a very different relationship. I mean, you know, you'd be at a restaurant eating dinner, and kids would come up and talk to you, and we carried little stickers and badges, and so very different relationship. And 
you didn't have the omnipresent telephone, you know, that uh, everybody threatening to record stuff. It's a very different, you know, a, a, I think a very different environment. And I think that the kind of threats that uh, are here, I mean, you know, I was a cop in Santa Monica, homelessness was a challenge even then, but not like the challenges that that the community is facing now. You know, mental illness was a challenge. In fact, when I was a police officer was when that historic change of Governor Reagan kind of changing the mental health system and everyone being disgorged happened. So we certainly had those issues, but it, nothing like it is now. So very, very different. And I think the sophistication of police officers, especially around domestic violence, has increased so much. And I think the expectation of what we expect police officers to do uh, compared to just arrest and, and think you know, the kind of social services is much different. It's a much different job now and much harder. How is DV for an officer? How has that changed specifically? What, what was what was it like for you back then? It's changed completely. I mean, you know, the back in the seventies, it was you go in and kind of separate, tell the guy to walk around the block, and you know, come back. And it's emerged to. And I was lucky enough to in the DA's office do a lot of domestic violence work and teach and do policy to where police officers get tremendous amount of training on the dynamics of domestic violence. The law has changed completely as to making arrest, primary aggressor laws, the availability of restraining orders. Um, they kind of weren't even a thing. They, they were there, but not nothing like we have now. The services that we have, you know, there are phenomenal services that the shelters and other uh, community-based organizations provide just weren't there. So it has really mainstreamed. It is, you know, before in the 70s, it was kind of, this, one of those calls. Now it really is part of what police officers do. They recognize how dangerous it is for both the the the, the victim, but for the officers. Um, and and within prosecutors' office, it is so much more mainstream than it was. And the level of sophistication is not even in this in the same this solar system. Do you? And this is a, a question about the DV area specifically. Do you think that police officers and even lawyers are getting enough training in that area of the law? I, I th that's a great question. I think there's a lot of training. I think that one of the challenges is keeping the training up. In other words, and I think the same is with us as lawyers and judges. You have the training. When do you go back and visit it? You know, uh, and I think that keeping it fresh and not doing the same thing, I, I do think there's a tremendous amount of training. I think that our concepts of DV, and we're seeing this in family law now, has changed. I think that there's a lot of, there's so many more domestic violence restraining orders now in family law than there were even a couple of years ago. And that has created its own kind of controversy and even um, pushback. Uh, amongst practitioners, I think even bench officers. Um, so I think that keeping the training up, it's changing so much, keeping it up, but changing. And, you know, the things that we're litigating now with Ned Carney and disturbing the peace and, and uh, you know, social media and surveillance is so different than what it was. Uh, I think we need to keep the training evolving all the time. Do you think that that makes the job of the judge that much more difficult, particularly in light of the evolution of the DV laws in this country and in California? 100%. I think that one of the things that is great about family law, but also challenging about family law, we hit social change first. Uh, you know, when, when the housing crisis in the recession hit in 2008, we were all talking about houses being upside down and HELOCs, and it hit us first. Uh, Same-sex marriage issues, we were dealing with that well before that was ever an issue. Um, parenting issues, we hit things first. And uh, I think I think that the, the change in, in DV laws, the 3044, the course of control is so well-intentioned. I think it has a lot of the broad umbrellas. And I think there's been a lot of ancillary impact that has made it hard. I think that from a calendar perspective, when you add the, the expansion of DV, the calendar priority, and the the what COVID did to the workload and challenges, it really puts pressure on um, on the courts, and uh, uh, 
And, you know, I would never, a lawyer would never ever do this, but I've heard rumors that sometimes file, people file DVs to jump out of the line to get priority. I know that never happens, but um, uh, that's a challenge. I mean, there's a lot of lawyers who believe that there's an overuse of the DV request nowadays and that it's used really as a strategic decision oftentimes at the beginning of the case. Do you feel that, or in your experience, do you think that when that happens, that there is, you know, how do you deal with those evidentiary issues that then arise in those situations where maybe there isn't enough, but you have yeah. a, you have a, a temporary order and you're dealing with issues of implicit bias that, that arise a lot of the time? I, I, I think that, first of all, judges have to have the courage and independence when a restraining order should be granted, granted, but when it shouldn't, to not. And, you know, sometimes the, the, the knee jerk is go ahead and grant it. I think that you owe a duty because, you know, in today's world, a restraining order has tremendous impact on, on the case, on the family, on the restrained person. You have to have the courage to say you haven't met your burden or it's not here. And, and I, think, I think the judges are up to that, but they really need to do that. Um, I think that you... You know, the interesting thing about family law and DV itself is, you know, years ago, the four, five, six, seven, 10 day DV trials were not a thing. And now that's a thing. So, you know, you get cases that are the self represented litigants who are kind of telling their stories. And then your next case is a very sophisticated case with document evidence and electronic evidence. So, you have to be able to kind of switch that that mode to deal with those. Um, uh, I, I do think that the the number of DV cases puts a tremendous pressure on the bench. I think that uh, Judge Kaufman and the the court is doing everything they can to try to provide relief and and more resources. But and I think especially out in the branches. It gets hard to schedule trials. And I think judges always feel bad where they've scheduled a trial on, say, Thursday, and they're ready to go. And you brought your expert in, and in comes the, the DV. And I know you probably had that experience and the like. And, and I, the judges don't you know, feel bad about that. Um, I think if there's a tremendous effort to figure it out. But it is a, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big load, an important load. It's very important, but it's, it's a big load. So... Has your, you know, it, it's an interesting perspective. We've talked a lot about DV and the expansion the calendar issues on the, on the program before. Do you think your time as a defense attorney and working on- well, I was a civil system, defense attorney, so not, not criminal. Civil defense attorney, but still seeing that side changed how you see cases moving through the system and how to prioritize these things? You know, I, I think that you, I think one of the things, and I was lucky because I learned from various, some very old school prosecutors who, you know, I was taught that one of the most noble thing a prosecutor could do is dismiss a case when the case wasn't there. And that it was your duty as kind of the lawyer for the state to really evaluate things uh, objectively. And when you're filing as a DA, you know, you need to really look at it from both sides. So I think I've always had that. I do think, and this is you know, a supervise, when I was supervising judge in life, you owe a duty to every litigant and you have to make sure that system is, the road through that system is down the middle and that a person prosecuting a DV case has as much opportunity to be heard as the person who is defending it. And it shouldn't, the road shouldn't move one way or the other. So absolutely, you have to be in the middle. As it, oh, go ahead, Sam. So you've talked now about restraint, essentially, right? Judicial restraint and making orders and not just jumping to the conclusions that mm -hmm. a temporary or a permanent domestic violence restraining order is there. DAs who are deciding, look, I'm not going to move forward with this because there isn't enough evidence. Mm -hmm. How does that translate to what family law lawyers are doing today? How can we help the bench manage its calendars and allow it to do its job, which is make decisions? Well, I, I, I think a couple of things. One, um, I heard you the first time. I heard you the second time. The third time, eh, the fourth time. So it's, 
you know, learn to present your case efficiently. Um, do you have to put in the 900 text messages or do you, do you sample through them? There might be cases where you put them all in. I think that putting the cases efficiently on is really an important thing to do. Um, your question, go back to your question that was so good. Remember, you're trying it to the judge and not to the other side. I also, my practice is always, before we get to custody, you need to show DV. So we're going to try, at least when I did them, we're going to, and still do them, we're going to do the DV first and then get to custody. For me, when you come into a DV and the, all the first questions are about custody, is this a, is this a DV or is this a RFO for custody? So I think you have to make sure that you're, you show the, those 6320 factors first, uh, that it stands. Um, and, and know when you've had enough, you know, you know, channel your inner, you know, less is more channel, your, channel your inner Coco Chanel. It's, it's, it's be, um, be efficient with what you do. Efficient lawyers are by far the best. So that obviously some of that has to come from your time as a DA and presenting cases to judges, right? Mm -hmm. So what cases from that from that time stick with you now? Where did you learn that? Maybe specific I, I, examples of where you were kind of thrown into the fire and you had to you had to learn that that the hard way. Well, I, I was very lucky as a DA. Got to but my, actually my first day as a DA. You know, now they have the academies and stuff. I walked in my first day as a DA, and the very gruff old head deputy said, "You the old, are you the cop?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "You have a trial starting up in Department 62. Go up there." Okay, sir. Um, and which side do I stand? It was a PCP drunk driver. I was like, Judge, which side do I stand on? Um, which was really fun, but certainly uh, a baptism by fire. Um, you know, as a day, you you start with, you, you get hand up. We call them hand up. So you're walking down the hall and the head deputy comes in and says, hey, there's a jury picked in department 105. Go and try it. Okay, sir. Um, uh, I was lucky. I got some. I got to do some really exciting assignments as a DA. I was the first DA in a place called the Stewart House, which I think a lot of family law lawyers know, which is a multidisciplinary child abuse center in Revolutionary Santa Monica. So I became a forensic interviewer for uh, got all that expert training and did child abuse cases. Most of what I did was violence against women and kids. Um, I was a law clerk on this, the, the, my first year on the Twilight Zone case, which was a tremendously unusual experience. Um, I worked the sex crimes unit for a long time, special unit doing child abuse and sexual assault cases. Um, I was actually the first ex-cop to be in the special investigation division, which prosecuted police officers. Um, and then I got to start the uh, DA stalking and threat unit. So I got to do some really interesting things as a DA. Was it difficult to investigate police? Everybody, you know, you hear in pop culture, the thin blue line, was that hard? You know, it's, I have so much, I loved being a police officer. I have so much respect for the profession. No, um, you know, no one's above the law. And um, I, I think that a, a neutral, honest investigation is it's, it's what, what Sam asked before, finding out what's there and evaluating it. Um, I thought it was a very one of the most noble things that did. Very hard because it's, you know, it, it, they're not black and white cases. But no, you did have you mentioned. I mean, we could spend the whole hour unpacking each one of those roles that you had in the DA office. Broadly speaking, after having that experience, after having all that experience, do you feel like the public's expectations of the criminal justice system, maybe through pop culture. Are the expectations right? Is the relationship with the community set up in the right way now? It always changes. I think that the the perceptions are shaped by media and television. And I know it's gonna be a horrible surprise to you, but it certainly is not like the television shows. Um, and, you know, I mean, the CSI effect that you can, you know, from one little tiny hair, you can unravel the entire thing in 30 minutes. There's that expectation. I think that we are in a time of tremendous transition about our perception of the criminal justice system. What's its purpose? Incarceration versus services and rehabilitation. I think we are in the midst of a revolutionary change compared to forever. Where that's going to end up, I don't know. 
um, uh, but it is changing dramatically. It, it, when I was supervising judge of criminal, it was, and we you know, try to put a lot of new programs in, um, but there are questions of resource allocation, relationship with the community, questions of implicit bias, how different communities and individuals are treated within the justice system. I think that it is a tremendously important self-examination and community examination, but those things are hard to do. What do you think family law attorneys should know about the criminal justice system as it stands today? I, I One thing I think that they need to know is like when, they, when people start contempt, they go, this guy's gonna go to jail for 30 days. No, he's not. Um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think, I do think that family law lawyers, and it would be actually some good training to do about the domestic violence impact and how it works and the, some of the consequences in the criminal side compared to the, the what we have in the, the family law side, people, there is a tremendous in, interchange and people don't know that you know, the priority of restraining orders, what happens when someone's convicted of DV, what are the punishments, what are the probation conditions? I don't think that there's a lot of um, exchange. I have seen a trend, and I think it's a healthy one, where family lawyers are bringing in experienced criminal lawyers in cases where there is exposure or a parallel case, and I think that's a very healthy thing. So to move off of a little bit off of the criminal background, sure. which, which is, we could talk about that forever. I know I could, I have about a hundred questions that I'm thinking about right now. So we'll have to come with those in the next part of this dialogue. It's hard to edit. See, Sam, it's hard. It's, it's, all right. I could go back and forth on this. That's what happens when you're old, you've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the Hague for, for a second and your experience. How did you get involved in Hague cases? So I was lucky enough to, uh, one of the things I did in the DA's office, I was a special assistant, the chief deputy of the DA's office, kind of the work for the number two person in the office doing policy work on, I did all the legislative work on domestic violence and sexual assault, so I got to go testify. And you see all the mail coming in, and one day this thing came from the ABA, where they were looking for volunteers to go to the Hague, the War Crimes uh, Tribunal, to do uh, essentially what were probable cause evalu uh, evaluations on war crimes. So I said, what the hell, I'll apply for it. Nothing, I won't hear anything. Um, I'll go ahead and apply for it. Well, fast forward six months and I was sitting in a, in a hotel in, in Den Haag. Um, and I got to go work at the war crimes uh, tribunal for uh, four months as a legal expert working on uh, cases from the former Yugoslavia. It was an unbelievable experience, um, absolutely unbelievable experience. Um, that led me, I got to do some work with the Rwandan War Crimes Tribunal and go to, go to Rwanda. Uh, so that kind of put me in that international group of lawyers. And then when uh, I was a supervising judge of, um, of the Family Law Division, you do all the hate cases. And, you know, LA, LA and New York were, were kind of at points of entry. So we have a tremendous number of hate cases. And from that, and because of those prior relationships, I got to build a relationship with the State Department. And now I'm one of the three network judge, international Hague network judges for the State Department. So it have been very lucky. It's, and in the Hague network, what we do is we provide technical support to judges in the United States, technical support to foreign judges, and we go and do training in different countries and train the judges in different countries, and I've gotten to go train judges in Guatemala, uh, Ecuador, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica. Really wonderful experience. The, all that international work and interacting with different systems change your perspective on our system? Yes and no. Um, one, when you first go to the countries, it seems very different. And then you got to lunch with the judges, and within 20 minutes, you realize you're doing the same job. It, it, they have the same challenge, but the resources, obviously, we are blessed, as challenged as we are with resources, we are blessed with resources compared to what a lot of these professionals do. But after 20 minutes, you realize they could come up and call a calendar in LA, you go ca call a calendar in Quito, Ecuador. It's the same challenge. It's parents with kids, it's visitation. It, and I think that's humbling. And, um, you know, it shows you how what we do is, is, so human, um, and, and I find every one of those trips, I get more from it than I think I give the, the judges there. 
So I imagine with everything that's going on in the world right now, your background with the Hague and the war crimes tribunal is, is very helpful to your understanding of the bigger picture. Would you agree? I hope so. I ho I, yeah, yes, I hope so. But boy, we are in a, in an a interesting time. Um, yes, but we are in challenging times. But yes, I think so. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's, it is fascinating to work with other systems and, um, and just the difference in them. I mean, the, the role of hearsay, the role of uh, informants, the role of taking pleas and turning, it's a, different systems have very different perspectives. And, and I think that what you need to do, especially as an American lawyer, is you, you have to respect other systems. And I think that the biggest thing I've learned with hate cases is, is very, very easy for us to get kind of paternal and say well, our system's the best. Well, it isn't. You know, you have to respect the sovereignty of these other countries. And has that translated to other areas of family law for you? For example, there's a lot of people now who enter into marital agreements, right? And they're people are much, the world is a smaller place, right? Mm -hmm. People are moving between states, between countries. And what impact, if any, does that have on your, when you're in your role as, you know, a judge pro tem? Well, I, I, it's a, I, it's a good question. I'm seeing many, many more multinational custody cases, not necessarily Hague, but they can develop into Hague, but they are where people, one person lives in England, another person lives in California. I think that I think that we should see, and I think we're seeing, and there's a lot of discussion within the Hague community about the role of mediation um, in, in those, because one of the challenges is a lot of people think that Hague petition solves the whole case. All it tells you is where the game's going to be played. It's just, is it, is it going to be in this football field or that football field? And once you decide that, then you start the custody issues, right? And um, it's incredibly expensive for people. And, you know, the, in the international custody cases, the, the logistics, the, the weeds, the, how do we get there? How's the time? How does it work? It's so important. I think there's a real role for mediation there and I'm seeing more of them come in. The, the cases, I mean, we've talked a little bit about today, how the cases are different, but they're also the same. At what point did you start thinking that way? For, you know, you're in the DA office. What At what point did you start thinking about the next step, becoming a judge, getting more involved in these issues? Um, so I was a DA for 16 years. So, you know, applied you know, probably 15, 14, 15 years in. And, you know, I, I, I love being an advocate. But I will tell you that being the neutral from the judge, I really like that perspective. I like the academic. And when I, 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 I taught law school for 30 years, so I like the academic side of it. Um, and I like that neutral. So um, that was the next evolution. This is going to warm the hearts of many practitioners watching. You actually asked to go into family law, right? Well, yes. So, so when I first started, no. So I first started as a commissioner. Yes, Commissioner Gordon. And yes, I have all the Batman stuff. Um, and the wonderful, amazing Aviva Bob called me and said, hey, I know you had all this uh, uh, domestic violence experience. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, I want you to go to uh, family. And I will. I'm not sure. And she said, you come Monday and um, start. And that started it. And from the minute I was there, I stayed. And when I got done uh, being, I, I was in family law until they asked me to come over and be the supervising judge of criminal. And when I got done with that, there's kind of a tradition in the court when you get done in a leadership role like that, you can kind of pick your assignment. And they said, where do you want to go? And I said, I want to go to a long cause family law trial. And they said, no, no, you get to pick your assignment. What would you like? I said, I want to go to a, a long cause family. And they said, you did anything wrong. What do you want to do? And uh, <laughs> You know, they let me go back, and I, I, I liked family law from the minute I went. I started a restraining order court as a commissioner. I liked it. I liked the bar. I liked the, I liked the variety of it. I liked the challenge of it. I liked that no, it's not, it's not binary. It's not yes, no. Um, so it, you know, I'm one of those unusual judges that it hit, you know, and became one of those lifers in it. If you had a magic wand. What would you do with all of your background in family law? What would you want to have change in our system? 
Well, I, I think at the end of the day, it's resources. I think that you know the 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 court system is a third independent branch of government. And if you look at the um, percentage of budget we get compared to the other two, it is de minimis. I think there, you know, I think that the court system is a place of service delivery for individuals like no other place. If you look at our self-help center, so many people, I think if we could increase resources in the ju judicial system, especially with some of the, I'm going to call them kind of neighborhood cases, the small claims, uh, evictions, uh, civil harassments, and provide wraparound services in those courts. I think we could see a lot of social change and a place to provide tremendous service delivery. You, you know, you've got you've got family law judges that are dancing as fast as they can and to get through. I mean, what, one of the one of the greatest things about this environment I'm in now compared to the bench is I have the time to do cases. So if I have to research an area of law, or I want to take extra testimony, or, what, or you guys want to present extra testimony, that's okay. I don't have that room full of people. And, and I, I think you intellectually, you provide, you're able to provide more attention to it. And I think that the judges on the bench need that. And I think we would retain judges longer, which I think is really important, because it takes a while to, to become that journeyman family law judge. It's not something that happens in six months, as you guys well know. You know, one of the things we touched on when we were talking about the DV is having the, for lack of a term, better way of putting it, chutzpah, to say, no, there's not enough evidence here, right? Um, do you think having family law judges that are on the bench longer, who spend more time really getting to learn about family law would help in decision-making processes? Absolutely. I mean, there's, you know, when you go on to family law, there's the technical side. And there's a lot of just law. There's a lot of rules and statutes. And, you know, uh, what's interesting about family law is part of what we do is very rule-based and you've got to learn it. But then you have tremendous discretion on the other side. And those two things live together, but kind of don't. And I think that when you first start family law, you have to, you're learning all those, you know, all the 40 through 20 factors and all this kind of stuff. But then as you mature, you start learning the culture. You learn the the bar culture. You learn kind of the what works, what doesn't work. What you know, what kind of orders make things happen. What kind of orders can actually kind of uh, make things worse. And you know, I think you learn that you know one of the one of the impulses for brand new family judges to kind of become the third parent and to make all these decisions. And you know, I think you learn that one, you that's not your role, and two, you're really not empowering the parents. You need to you know, pick the picker and, and the parents need to parent their kids. So yes, the long, absolutely the longer you're in there, the better. So that, that begs the question, what makes recruiting and retention so difficult? And then what would make it more attractive for judges? You know, I think, fam first of all, I think there's like lawyers, there's certain people that are drawn to it. You know, there's a lot, it's very emotional. It's, I think it's hard for some people you know, and you never know the background that people have had in their own lives, and they may have had a, a gone, been a child of divorce or something, which is difficult, but it is, it is emotionally difficult for people to do it. I think for me, having done, one of the things that you learn doing sex crimes and the like is you provide better service with kind of compassionate distance, that you need to keep that objective, remain compassionate, remain um approachable, but you need to keep that distance so you're making objective uh, evaluation. So I was able to bring that in. Some people can do that. Some people can't. The workload is extremely varied. I mean, you go from a self-represented DV to the next is talking about how do we allocate stock dividends and, and, you know, and you have to have that ability to do that shift and do that. So I think you're looking at a, a limited population who wants to do it. And the other thing is family law judges work really hard. And, um, you know, and, and I th the other thing is the, the, the reality is uh, people complain about family law judges more than um, any other area. And, you know, do judges want to expose themselves to that? So I, I think that recruiting will, it's, it's traditionally been hard when I was supervising. It was a very hard thing to do. It's, it's not as much recruiting as retention. Hmm. 
And do you think that the rise in the use of private judging is in part a reaction to the lack of resources and retention issues? It's a good question. I think that, you know, I think we're at a time where a lot of us with experience came out. So, you know, I feel very blessed to be in a place where we have great depth, which is great to be able to exchange with those judges. I think that time, I think that accessibility is a big issue. I, you know, I, when I was supervising, I went to the master calendar. One of the reasons is I think that we need to get these cases done. The, lo the longer they stay, the worse they get. Pamela cases don't get better as they sit and wait. And I think that one of the challenges litigants have and lawyers have, and the judges certainly know it, is how long does it take to get your case to trial? How long does it take to get the RFO on custody? And I think that the pandemic really hurt that. And I think that um, people are looking for alternatives to get resolution. And you know, the challenge becomes it becomes so expensive to keep the case alive for an extra year that sometimes it's even cheaper to get it done than it is to keep it, keep that burn rate going for a year. So yeah, I, I do think that the delay has given a rise. How can the bar itself engage more and move the ball forward on these issues? First of all, I think that the family law bar is really good about engaging with the bench. Um, uh, you know, uh, organizations like Beverly Hills Bar, they would meet the judges night, having judges MCLE, LA County Bar. There is more interaction between the family law bar and, I mean, the civil bar too, but the family law bar has, I think, a really good relationship. I think the more that you foster those, I think that the more dialogue there is, the better. Um, I think that with Judge Kaufman, you have a judge in supervising who wants to hear from the bar, keeping those, keeping those, uh, keeping those forms of keeping the forms of dialogue open while still respecting the bench has to remain independent. So there, there, you know, you need to, you need to be able to talk, but when, when the, the bench says, look, I can't go farther and respect that. But I do, I actually, I think the family law bar does a tremendous job in building relationships with the bench. So there's this really great, really smart person who once made this, read this quote to me, essentially, and it was, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. It's by George Bernard Shaw. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a very apt description of what happens in family law. What role does that, does communication have in these cases and how they're prolonged, really? Tremendous. Um, uh, you can't when you're when you're looking at cases from especially in mediation compared to well actually even in, in the in the JFT world, you can see immediately when the lawyers have real communication, and you can see where it's they're just throwing letters and words at each other, um, and um, hearing the other side is the path to success. You know there 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 are very few very few cases where it's a hundred percent one way or hundred percent the other. There are those, but normally there's the result is somewhere in between and realizing that and hearing. Um, I do think the manner of communication, you know, uh, is important. I never saw the word outrageous and saying the two words outrageous and sanctions. I thought that was a big law firm at first when I started. Um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the desire to punish the other side and, you know, sending the letters with all the, it has that help, you know, um, in fact, I think some of the most effective things I've ever seen a lawyer do is when someone sends that and they send back this very kind of gracious, short, it, it disarms it. Um, but getting away from that kind of sanction culture, I think, is very important. We only have a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. We've learned so much and benefited from your assessment of what's going on and how to improve it. For yourself, though, what do you want your legacy to be either in the family law community or really more broadly? Well, it's going to sound very corny that I was of service and was fair. You know, um, I spent 42 years in public service and loved it. Um, I love this new evolution. It's different. Um, I, I mean, I, I, it sounds very cool. I feel very blessed to have done the things that I do and I hope that it, um, um, it helps people. That's why I enjoy teaching. It's um, been very lucky um, and continue to be. So 
Um, I hope that's the legacy. What final advice would you give to your younger self or to a new attorney just starting out in family law? Well, my son's a, a, a newer attorney. So I talk all the time, not to listen to me, he does, but is one, take a breath. It, first of all, care for yourself. You're in this for the long term. And self-care is very important. Mindfulness, self-care, because you're going to do this for a long time. Two, when you feel, it's same with judges and lawyers, when you feel yourself about to send that email or about to say something, take a breath. You know, walk away from the computer, take a break in court for a minute, and then reevaluate it. Um, and and always look to the long term. You know, there's tactical and strategic. Strategic is how does it end? What's the end game? And so many people get wrapped up in what's going on right here. They're not thinking about, well, how does this end for my client? Think about the end. We always used to tell DAs, you should think about your closing argument when you're filing the case. Because what you file dictates what that closing argument is, even though it might be a year or two years down the line. Family lawyers should do the same. What's the end result? But, but the whole thing is, you know, this is a hard work. You're working hard. You're working long hours. Um, care for you. Make sure you're going to do this a long time. Because we want, I've got to tell you, from the judge's perspective, having experienced lawyers is, any judge will tell you, give me a really hard case with experienced good lawyers any day over an easy case with, with without that. So um, you're in a hard job. You're in a job that impacts you. Take care of yourself. I think that that's good advice, no matter what line of work somebody's in or what they're doing. And with that, I'm going to say thank you, Judge Gordon, for thank you so much. joining us today. And thank you, Dan, for agreeing to let me sit in on this conversation, participate. Um, this wraps up today's episode. Please mark your calendars now and join us for our next episode or episodes, all of them at 12.30 p.m. on the first Wednesday of each month. Next up will be Stacey Phillips and then Grace Jamra and Michael Hanasab, as well as Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens uh, following. And then beyond that, we've got George Harvey Silverman, who will also be joining us. So there's an exciting lineup. Thank you to Jenna, Leslie, and Belinda at the bar, the Family Law Executive Committee led by Aaron Gray and Chelsea Stevens, and of course, our section sponsors. Most importantly, thank you, Judge, Judge Gordon, for being here and for sharing so much about your history and your perspective on family law with us. Thank you for the opportunity.